we talk about believing this guy Jesus. But what does it mean to believe? You know, last week we talked about the church is, is the, defined as the Christian community, as those who believe in Jesus, who call Jesus Lord. But what does that mean? Because a lot of times we can just be part of the club, but not actually believe. We can show up, but we're not actually sold out to who this Jesus is. And I've said many times, if we get Jesus wrong, we get everything else wrong. We've got to make sure we get Jesus right. And when I say that, I mean we've got to make sure we get Jesus right in our lives. Because as I'm thinking about what do we believe, what does it mean to believe, I'm convinced that we're either shaped by Jesus or we're shaped by something else. Those are the two options. Now, something else is obviously a very broad concept, but, but, but we're shaped by, by things in this world, and so we're shaped by Jesus or something else. And so we gather together today, right here, right now, it's what we call the, the corporate worship service, or the worship services is commonly what we refer to this as. And so we come and we worship God. Now we affirm that Jesus is fully God, and so when we're talking about God, we're talking about God the Father, who's the creator, but also Jesus is embedded in one, along with the Holy Spirit forms the Trinity. But, but we worship God, and, and we worship God because, as the Apostles', Apostles Creed says, uh, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. He is the Almighty. And we have several scriptures that point to who God is. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we find that it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a foundational truth for fathers of Jesus that God created. And then we have in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, where it says, You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first of the Ten Commandments. And, and, and these are foundational things that we know, okay, we should not worship anything besides God. And then First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 25, it says, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring this specific verse up today is because feared above all other above all gods. There's an underlying assumption here that there are other gods in this world. And what I mean when I say that is there are other things that seek to have you worship it. And that's that's true. There are things that say worship me. Now we don't necessarily use the term worship, but think give your money to me. Give me your allegiance to me. Give your loyalty to me. And, and, and not that though, though these things are bad, but when we're talking about God, we're talking about Jesus is above everything else. Jesus is on one level and everything else is on a whole different level. But we're either shaped by Jesus or we're shaped by something else. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And one of the things about this verse is that it affirms the eternality of God, that God is eternal. He was, He is, and always will be. There never is a time where God wasn't. God is. And so we worship this God because He is the Almighty. There is nothing that is above Him. There is nothing that's even on His same level. So that's why we worship this God. But we come to this corporate worship service, and we have different practices and different things that we do. We commonly sing songs. We'll partake in the sacraments like communion, in which we will do today. We'll read uh, scriptures. We'll hear a sermon. We'll pray. We'll give offerings. We'll serve. We'll do all of these types of things. Now, commonly, when you talk about the worship service, you, the two probably main things is preaching and singing. Those are probably the two main things that you think of. And, and Scripture talks a lot about, about, about praising God. In Psalm chapter 100, verse 1 and 2, it says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful song. And as I think about this, it says, shout for joy. It doesn't say be quiet. You know, there should be nobody sleeping when we're worshiping, right? And we can worship when we preach, right? So nobody should be sleeping right now. But, uh, but, but we shouldn't be quiet. We should be enthusiastic. And maybe it's a belabored metaphor, but we talk about sporting events. We're loud at those things, right? But why can't we be loud for Jesus? And if you're a terrible singer, don't sing off key to annoy everybody else, but you can still make noise, 
right? We don't have to be silent, and we should not be silent, but also says, worship the Lord with uh, gladness and come before Him with joy. We should not look like a miserable sack of whatever when we worship Jesus, okay? We should be happy about it, right? But you, you notice a lot of times, in most places, when it talks about worshiping God, it didn't say, worship God if you feel like it. Worship God if the song is, is one you like. Worship God if your life circumstances are going well. No, it doesn't say that. Because He's the Almighty. There's nothing above Him. Now, there may be times where you've had the worst week ever. And coming to worship is really, really hard. But every week is not your worst week ever. So we have to make sure, are, are we worshiping our circumstances or are we worshiping Jesus? Because so many times we worship our circumstances or what is or isn't happening in our lives. And in Psalm 149, verse 3, it says, Let him praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. If you're familiar with the Church of the Nazarene, particularly in the 60s and 70s and, and a lot of the holiness traditions uh, and, and other traditions as well, there's a lot of legalism that was going on back then. And um, in our manual, it actually said, you cannot dance. Now, it, and it, it changes now. You, you can dance as long as it honors Jesus or something like that. But, um, but uh, if, if you've ever seen a two-year-old dance, you know there is nothing sinful about dancing necessarily, right? Um, but, 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 you know, when you think of worship, we talk about, we think of, well, we make noise with our mouth. We sing. Worship is holistic. It includes your body. Right? Maybe, maybe you have terrible rhythm and you can't clap on beat. Right? Okay? So please don't clap really loud. That's going to distract everybody else. But, but you need to make sure you clap on two and four, right? Two and four. Right? No, actually, or is it one and three? I don't even remember. I don't know. Uh, 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 well, Sam, is it one and three or two and four? Two and four, okay? So, all right. So, so um, Sam, Sam's really going to drive, Sam and, and Steve will drive that home uh, for now on, but clap on two and four, okay? But, but, but worship should include our whole body. If you're worshiping Jesus like this, right? That's not worshiping Jesus. You are neglecting the, your body. Now, I'm not saying you need to get up and do a whole dance or anything like that, but the fact of the matter, we need to worship Jesus holistically with everything that we are, which can include movement and dancing and allowing the Spirit to move you. Now, but just because the Spirit moves, I mean, uh, it, Spirit moves us in different ways. We don't want to manipulate it or act like somebody else necessarily, but we come together almost always on Sunday mornings, to worship Jesus. Now, now, most churches, if they have one worship service, that's a corporate worship service, they have it on Sunday mornings. And, and there may be a few exceptions. Now, you get to larger churches, they have multiple services, they can have it at other times. But there's, there's, there's a question of, well, well why Sunday? Why, why are we here right now on Sunday morning? Why is that? And, and the short answer is that Jesus rose on Sunday. We get to all the Gospels talk about it. In John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So, so first day of the week is Sunday in the Jewish tradition. Saturday was the Sabbath, the last day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. And so we come every Sunday as a reminder that this Jesus we believe in is alive. That's why we're here. Right? Jesus is alive. And so, so when, when we come, when we enter, when we drive here, we are consciously saying we are gathering because we serve the risen Savior. Not because somebody said Sunday should be a good idea, but because Jesus rose on Sunday, and so we, we remind, remind ourselves every Sunday that Jesus rose. Now, I reference the Sabbath, and, and part of this, this worship concept and believing in Jesus, it ties into it, so I just wanted to, to mention this. When is the Sabbath? And there can be a debate among this, uh, because the Jews, the Sabbath is still on Saturday. right? That did not change with Jesus. Jesus didn't really impact them in any of that type of stuff. 
And, and so there are some that, that say, well, the Sabbath is still on Saturday. Some that say, well, the Sabbath is for Christians is on Sunday. Well, those who, who, who say Sabbath is on Saturday would say Sunday is now the Lord's Day. And, and the issue is not that, that we, uh, for Christians, that we have this specific day, well, it's either Saturday or Sunday or whatever day it is, because we as followers of Jesus are not under the law. We're under, under love and grace. Now, this does not negate the need for the Sabbath because God created us with the need for the Sabbath. So the point is that we make sure we take the Sabbath, not that we follow the law. So there's a difference there. Now, now with the Sabbath, we do have to recognize taking a Sabbath is not binging Netflix. Those are not synonymous. That is not what God had in mind in Exodus chapter 20 when he said, take a Sabbath. He said, just binge Netflix. No, it's about resting in the presence of Jesus. And there's a difference. Now, resting in the presence of Jesus can sound really, really boring if we don't believe in this Jesus. See, if we spend our first 31 years of life like Chuck did, I just did church, but didn't actually know this Jesus, then resting in Jesus is not going to be exciting or engaging. And resting in Jesus can be many different things. Resting in Jesus is not necessarily just sitting there reading your Bible for 12 straight hours. It's about being in his presence. And sometimes that can be through our hobbies. It can be through other activities. It can be through those types of things. It's not work, but it's in Jesus. And so, so I, I wanted to digress just a little bit with that, of, of the Sabbath as I, as I referenced it. But, but we worship, we come together, and, and we worship, and, and in some, some ways, I'm hesitant to talk about this, but there are benefits to why we come here. And I'm hesitant because sometimes, well, if there's no benefit, I'm just going to do something else. Right? We, we come here because it's, it's, it's the Almighty that we're worshiping, the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. It's not about us. And so on some level, the benefit is it gives us humility. It makes us recognize that, that we are not the center of the universe. But one of the great things about God is that even though we aren't the center of the universe, even though there's nothing special about you and me, he invites us to participate with him. He says, says I'm the God of the universe. You are minuscule for all intents and purposes, but I want to invite you to participate in my plan of redemption in this world. God invites us, and we see that throughout Scripture in several references in 1 Thessalonians 3, Nehemiah 8, Psalm 8, Proverbs 9, of God is inviting us, and we're worshiping because God is bigger than us. But one of the things about worship is that it's instilling habits within us. And on some level, that can seem awfully ritualistic or rigid, but I love what scholar James K.A. Smith writes. He says, habits are inscribed in our heart, th heart through bodily practices and rituals that train the heart. Over time, rituals and practices, often in tandem with aesthetic phenomena like pictures and stories, mold and shape our precognitive disposition to the world by training our desires. And so what he's saying is that rituals and practices shape our heart. And on some level, I think there can be pushed back to that because, like, oh, I, 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 I don't necessarily like that. I, I don't want Jesus to be rigid about rituals and practices. But think about your life. When you were younger, because we don't do this anymore, uh, when you were younger, remember this thing called peer pressure. Of you were pressured, you, you felt pressure to do things with your group of friends that you wouldn't necessarily have done, but then that ended up becoming part of who you are, whether it was good or whether it was bad. And, and you know, sometimes it's good to be pushed. You know, we, we may not know we really enjoy something until we try it, and once we try it, those rituals and practices can be embedded on our heart. And, and, and as I think about this, I'm like, well, well, who would want to do that? Why, why, why would we do that? Well, well, we do that with other things in life, too. You know, there are certain, certain beverages that have this connotation that it's an acquired taste. Things like beer or coffee are, are, are gross, but it's an acquired taste. Then why would anybody want to do that? If it's an acquired taste, why would you drink that? 
Well, it becomes a ritual and a practice because of the group of friends that you have that do that. And then it becomes your heart's desire. See, so these rituals and practices that we partake in are really important because they shape our heart's desires. And so we have to make sure we're careful of what things we allow into our life because they shape us. And you're either shaped by Jesus or you're shaped by something else. It's it's either or. Now, if you've been going to church for any length of time, you recognize, you're comfortable with the setting. You know what to expect. You know the routine. So we change things. You may, not, you may be fine with the change, but you notice the change. And part of what worship is trying to do is show us who this Jesus is so we just know him. And there's a difference between knowing facts about Jesus and knowing Jesus. And, I, and it comes, to me, it comes back to things of growing up, you knew things. And and I know I've shared this before, but I grew up in a town of 700 people. And I can only tell you two street names of that town. But even though I haven't been there in years, I can still get around the town. And, And in that town, there are three churches. There's a post office. There's a Casey's gas station. It came my senior year of high school. That was a big deal. And, um... And then there, there is a, a restaurant that sometimes is open, sometimes is not, and there's no way of telling when it's open or not. Um, that's all that's in my town. And, and so, so, so as I think back to my town, I, I remember, I go, you know what? I had a classmate, Brian. He lived by the one four-way stop in town. And, and you know, there was a four-way stop because two of the roads didn't line up, and it was really weird. That was the only reason there was a four-way stop. And he lived next to Tom, who did a lot of body work. And Tom lived catty corner from Kevin until Kevin and his family moved to the last road in town before you get to the big park. And you turn there, and you go all the way to the end of the road. That's how I know the town, right? I, I don't know the street name, but I know the town. And there's a big difference between looking at a map and, and knowing the street names of the town and knowing the town. There's a big difference between listening of a sheet of paper, knowing of the facts of Jesus, and knowing Jesus. And so what we do when we worship Jesus is we're trying to make it so we just know this Jesus. So who Jesus is just comes out from us. And so sometimes we can feel like we're just going through the motions. And you know, there's discipline in that. And there's worship in that. I hope we have emotions with following Jesus, but showing up sometimes is what Jesus needs so he can shape us. So then we can really believe in who this Jesus is. And so we gather as fathers of Jesus. And we gather to recognize that we're, we're part of something bigger than ourselves, so we're not the center of the universe. We gather so that we're shaped by Jesus, but we also gather to support, encourage, and keep each other accountable, to help spar each other on so that we can do better. You know, Proverbs tells us iron sharpens iron. That's, that's uncomfortable sometimes, but it makes for a much better product. But, you know, one of the things that, that blessings to me is from Matthew chapter 18. When Jesus says, for where two or three gather my name, there I am with them. Jesus is here. We have gathered together, and so Jesus promises to meet with us. And so when we gather, one of our primary purposes is to give glory to Jesus, to praise him, because remember, he is the almighty creator of heaven and earth. That's who he is, and so that's why we gather here to be shaped by him, to hear from him, and to praise his name. Psalm 150, verse 6 says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. If you're breathing, praise Jesus. Right? If you're not dead, praise Jesus is another way to say it. So if you still have life in you, you have value because you can praise Jesus. Right? Your value is not because of what society says you're worth, but because you can praise Jesus, because you can be in relationship with him, because your worth comes from him. But, you know, our our world attempts to indoctrinate us. And and while there are super negative examples of that with extreme ideologies, that's not necessarily what I'm getting at. Because we can recognize those extremes as being really, really dangerous. But everything in this world is competing for our attention, for our money, for our loyalty. Everything is. 
And you can think of, uh, of certain things like, like Crest and Colgate. On some level, they're working together because they say they want you to know it's really important to brush your teeth, but ours is better. Right? They're fighting so that you believe that Crest or Colgate or whatever brand you use is the one that is the best. Don't, don't give that other company your loyalty. Worship us. And, and, and I say worship, not necessarily, there, there, there can be difference in loyalty and worship. I'm not sure if anybody I know that's not a dentist that, that would even begin to worship something like Crest or Colgate. But... Um, um, it's, it's, it's wanting us to give our lives to these things. And one of the, the things I, I think that happens is, is the world does a really good job of trying to encompass our whole self. Sometimes in the church, we focus so much on what well, we sing songs or the spiritual side of things, and we forget to encompass our whole selves in this worshiping and believing in Jesus. Now, I've referenced the author James K.A. Smith. He wrote a book about oh, 10 or 12 years ago um, about worship, and in this, he uses the analogy of a mall and how a, a, the mall encompasses everything about you as it tries to draw you in. Now, with how our world has changed, I'm not sure if a mall really applies as much as it used to. Um, you go to the mall here in town, it doesn't really do much to draw you in, unfortunately. But, but as I was thinking about this, I was reminded, I, um, a few weeks ago, I went to a Major League Baseball game against the St. Louis Cardinals, the Atlanta Braves, and uh, went down in St. Louis, and it, 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 was, it was a really, really fun, fun trip. And on a Wednesday afternoon, a 12.15 start, the records show that 36,300 people attended. On a Wednesday afternoon, right? Don't tell me that's not a place of worship, right? And not that that's bad. We can enjoy these things. We can have passions. We can have hobbies. We can go in and have entertainment, and that's fine. But as I look back at that experience, I think of how my whole self was encompassed in this experience. And so the first thing is you walk up to the stadium, and you're just like, wow, this is a huge place. This is a big, extravagant place. And there are, there are these jumbo screens everywhere. There's TVs all over the concourse. And you see the lights and, and, and just the, the beauty of the field. And so visually, you're engaged. Then, then you're, you're walking around, and then your smell, your sense of smell comes into play. And, 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 and if you're into to, to baseball, particularly things like, like, like smell of, of dirt, freshly cut grass, of pine tar, those smells resonate with you. And even if you're not, you smell hot dog, you say, this smells good, right? All right? Or, or popcorn, and, 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 and they have all these other types of foods that just draw your sense of smell. And with that, you have your sense of taste which most ballparks have, have a lot of the same things with hot dogs and hamburgers and popcorn, but, but most ballparks also have their own unique things. There's barbecue or, or Philly cheesesteak or something like that that does, just melts in your mouth or is really, really good. But it also encompasses your sense of hearing with sound. And, and again, back to the baseball analogy of, of you know, the crack of the bat or the pop of the glove. But there's also, also cheers you know, crowd cheering, the announcer, there's music. And if you go to, to a professional sporting event, for whatever reason, organs become synonymous with some of the music that's played with that. But your sense of hearing is engaged as well as your sense of touch. You know, the, the feeling the seams of the ball or the wooden bat. Now, you don't always get that. Most times you don't when you go to a professional game like that. But, you know, even your hand on the, on the rail... Or, or how the, the, the bleachers or the seats feel. You know, and, and the seats may be uncomfortable, but it's part of the experience. And so your whole body is encompassed in this experience. What would it look like if worshiping Jesus was the same way? If we came to worship Jesus saying, we're going to encompass our whole self. Now, I'm not saying we should have pot roast cooking in a crock pot over there uh, during the service, by all means. But, 
But we need to make sure we just don't separate, well, we worship Jesus in this way. We need to worship Jesus with everything that we are. And so what we're talking about here are these things called liturgies. There are secular and sacred liturgies. And if you went to and certain churches have, have more what we call liturgical practices, more, uh, has more of a formula for how the, the, the worship flows, and every church has a formula, right? I mean, I'm not, not, there, there's nothing wrong with that, um, as long as we're not slaves to it, I guess. But, but the fact of the matter is, you know, we do this and this and this and this and this, and we become used to these liturgies, and we, be, we are shaped by them. But the issue is, are we actually being shaped by Jesus to the extent that he wants to shape us? Because we're either being shaped by Jesus or something else. But coming back to James K.A. Smith, he says, before we articulate a worldview, we worship. And, and so, as I think about that, somebody who comes to know Jesus worships Jesus before they can articulate everything about Jesus. Right? Before we can articulate all the facts, we say, I know I want this Jesus. I need this Jesus. And some people may have a more academic approach to Jesus and learn a bunch of stuff about Jesus beforehand, but we still have a lot to learn about Jesus. So it's not about learning things, it's about being shaped by Jesus. It's about coming to him and allowing him to change us. But as we think about this Jesus of, well, do you believe in Jesus? And if you do believe in Jesus, how should that impact what you do? And one of the things it should do is it should impact you so that you tell others about this Jesus. And that can be a real intimidating thing for us. That can be really difficult and, and, and really dicey in, in, in many ways. But if you've received the love and grace of Jesus Christ, you should want others to receive the love and grace of Jesus Christ as well. And I love the phrase, you don't have to get clean before you get in the shower, as it applies to our faith. You don't have to get clean before you come to Jesus. Jesus. Jesus just wants you to come to him. In Romans chapter 15, verse 7, it says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Oh, sorry, nope, that was, I must have skipped that one. So Romans chapter 15, I don't know if I put it up there or not. It says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Accept each other. We need to do that. So, so, so this is a place of accepting, of re, regardless of where you, where, you, where you are in your spiritual journey, this is a place where you're welcome. See, but in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus tells us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And, and as I, uh, you know, that's what we're called to do. We're, we're called to tell people about this Jesus. We're called to accept them where they are and tell them about Jesus so that they can know this Jesus that we know. But you know, there are a couple things we can do to, to, to get the ball rolling. And, and, and first is, people should know that you go to church. Now, we don't have to push that down their throat, but people should know that. Not that, not, not that we have to be ostentatious about that or anything, but... You should be able to answer, answer, why do I go to church? Or why do I go to that church, whatever that may be? Because if you don't know why you go attend a certain church, nobody else is going to be compelled to attend the church with you. You know, if you don't know why you follow Jesus, nobody's going to want to follow Jesus with you. And, and, and when we're talking about, about inviting someone to a corporate worship service like this, you know, maybe share details about, well... Here, here's something about the church that will make you feel comfortable. You know, one of the things is, is only recently graduating uh, college grads do we actually embarrass on stage, right? Right? <laughs> if you're not one of those, you're good. But, but we don't embarrass people, or, or, or you, don't have to, you won't be singled out, or, or something that would say, this is what excites me about what's happening at the church. And so when we talk about inviting people to church, we start with, well, why do I attend? What do I like about it? And you know, those are just basic things that we can do of, of why do I follow Jesus? And if we can't answer those questions, then I think we really paint ourselves into a corner. And we have to ask ourselves, do I actually believe in this Jesus? Because so many times we can go through life just doing church. I'll tell you what, just doing church is not satisfying. Just doing church is going to leave holes in your life 
that you long for something else, and you're going to fill with something else likely. And often that will bring hurt and pain and heartache. And I'm not saying Jesus is going to make life easy or perfect for you. But when you think about believing in Jesus and ourselves or, or inviting somebody else, everyone worships something. We don't call it worship, but we do. We fill our life with things that we elevate above everything else. See, but most people worship multiple things. And they can be at different levels. But we worship different things, whether it's a sports team, whether it's finances, whether it's our family, whether it's our career, whether it's our health, whatever it is, we worship something. You're either shaped by Jesus or you're shaped by something else. And I ask, is Jesus just another thing you're worshiping? Is Jesus another thing that you put on your schedule and you come be part of the club? Or are you actually worshiping Jesus and being shaped by him as the almighty creator of the universe? The question I ask you is, what do you worship? Because if we're not careful, we're going to be sucked in to these secular liturgies that call us to worship things that aren't Jesus. And those things may not be bad. They may actually be fun or good or helpful. But if it's not Jesus, it's not Jesus. We have to make sure we recognize the difference with that.